Hello and welcome to the Alpha Male Podcast, the podcast where we talk about what it means to be an alpha male. In today's society, in today's culture, with so many forces trying to weaken men today, we're not afraid to stand up and stand out and be strong and dominant and in control, made in the image and likeness of our Creator, God Almighty. Today we're going to be talking about another facet of rioting and civil unrest, and we'll tie in a little bit of active shooter as well. Hopefully you listen to part one of that, and this by God's grace will become a several part series. Before we get into today's topic, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a review of the podcast. I'm going to reiterate, make sure you're subscribed. If you like the last one and this one, hopefully you'll be subscribed to get the rest of the series. And there's some big announcements coming out by God's grace for Alpha Male and Gunfighter Life and Simple Man Sermons. So stay tuned for that. And again, like, subscribe, leave a review. With that, I'm going to plug in the bio. You want to skip it, you can skip around 3 minutes and 45 seconds from where it starts. That being said, I am going to plug in the normal bio in a little bit after the 3 minutes and 45 seconds to include experience with civil unrest, rioting, and just people behaving badly. Who am I? First and foremost, I am a servant of God and a follower of Jesus Christ. God is number one in my life and everything that I do in this podcast is no different and I don't apologize for that. A little bit about me in the background. I grew up, I guess what you would consider a heathen, didn't grow up a Christian, but I grew up in the southeastern United States, what most would consider very poor, hunting and fishing and shooting. Joined the Marine Corps at 17, did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. After my combat tours in Iraq, I was an urban warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I also served in law enforcement for several years in LAPD. I worked patrol assignments and more specialized assignments. Where by God's grace, he got me through some nasty places in this world of war zones. And some of the nastiest streets in the country. Not because I am better, because God chose to have mercy on me and had a purpose for me, and I'm thankful for that. After my time in law enforcement, I was a private contractor for federal government for a three-letter government agency I won't specify, doing private contracting work. I'm very much involved in guns and gunfighting. I also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. I should say my primary MOS is in both branches of the military or infantry as of one sort or another. Specialized infantry in the Marine Corps and an MOS that no longer exists. I started competition shooting even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I won my first gold medal even before I joined the Marine Corps at 17. I've been blessed by God with the talents he's given me to win more shooting competitions than I can remember. I've won most of my competitions in rifle and pistol, but I've also competed in archery and shotgun and even muzzleloader, uh, knife throwing, hatchet throwing. I've competed in all that. I've also been a professional big game hunter and guide. Like I said, I grew up hunting and, and fishing and shooting. I've done it to put meat on the table because I like to put food on the table with the talents God's given me. I don't apologize for that. I've done it as a professional hunter and guide. I've slain all manner of beasts. And guided for all manner of beast, bear and wolf and elk and deer, mule deer, white tailed deer. I've slain ram and fallow deer and countless animals. And I don't apologize for that either. FBI certified firearms instructor, NRA, and a bunch of other three letter government agency certifications. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Psalm 144. I've been blessed to be the commander of a tactical team, an SRT special response team in a large metropolitan area, where our primary job was to stop active shooters. 
But again, first and foremost, I'm a servant of God, called by God to share the good news, preacher, a fisher of men. With that, we will roll into the day's topic. So a little bit about the things I've seen in life as it pertains to civil unrest and rioting. So I joined the Marine Corps at 17, and that was way back in 2001. This was before we went to war. This was pre-9-11. And I was in Kuwait waiting to cross the line, waiting to cross the border into Iraq. We had not yet invaded Iraq. We had not yet declared war. But we knew it was coming. We were sitting in our tents on the Kuwait border of Iraq. I had obviously already been through boot camp and basic training. And to my unit, we had shipped out. We all knew war was on the horizon, but we didn't know exactly when. And I don't have a way to prove this. And I'm not going to go back and try and substantiate it now. But I, we were told, and I have no reason to doubt, that we were if not the first unit, one of the very first units to cross the border into Iraq. And I was infantry. And I saw things that only a Marine Corps infantryman in war would see. I got to see some unbelievably awesome and horrible things. One thing I got to see was I was in Baghdad and I was a specialized infantry and I was attached to, let's just call it a very special unit. And we were in Baghdad covertly before we destroyed it. So I got the very let's say unique perspective. I was blessed to see Baghdad as a functioning major metropolitan city. Much as you would see in New York or L.A. Or London or Tokyo. Now culturally those places are very different. But they all have things in common. And they, they are a functioning society and culture. And a large metropolitan area. They had electricity. They had running water. They had culture. The neighbors in our safe house. Next to our safe house were British. From what I understand, there was a pretty well-thriving Christian community and Jewish community before we went in there. It was a large metropolitan city. It was a big, big city with a large population. I just, I just looked up, and this is one source, but it says the population was over 5 million in Baghdad pre-invasion. And I got to see that city as the units came in, as we invaded it, as we bombed it. I got to see beautiful marble floors destroyed under several tons of tank and war machine. I got to see a functioning society with happy people walking down the street and kids playing. Two packs of ruling factions, call them what you want, tribes, radical Islamic extremists. Fighting in the street, shooting in the street. A society where once cops and police cars meant order to having no idea what side they were on, whether they brought peace or chaos. The sound of gunfire in the streets and buildings literally being bombed and crumbling. The loss of utilities, the loss of things like power and clean running water. And sadly fields of bodies just laying there in the sun. And you know, it didn't take very long. I got to see that perspective that most other soldiers and marines that came after me did not get to see. Because it was always a war-torn place when they came. They had never seen it as it was before. Much like any modern city in America and Europe would be. They didn't get to see it descend. They didn't get to see the breakdown quick it was, how violent it was, how unpredictable it was for the people that lived there. But I'm blessed that God got me through that safely and that I can share that with you today and then we can talk about it and learn from it and glean from it 
and that you hopefully never have to see anything that horrible. Also, went to work for LAPD. And as you might imagine, we had our share of rioting and protests. And I would call them more, especially after the Iraq incidents, especially after the war, I would call them more of civil disobedience and protests. Were there some violence? Yes. We obviously trained for civil unrest and rioting. We obviously got deployed to civil unrest and what I would call more not so peaceful protests. Also dealt with this both in training and getting ready for when I was a private contractor. And I was the commander of a tactical team when the large metropolitan area we protected got shut down for COVID. And I got to see on American soil just a light sprinkling of civil unrest and got to see quite a high spike in violent crime during that time. People getting desperate. People protesting. Because of things going on in other cities. In Minneapolis. Which is not where I was. Which is quite a far ways away. There was some. Let's just call it racial tension. And some of the people that served under me. In fact one of the members that served. Me on that tactical team. One of their family members was killed. In, in uh, let's call it a protest gone wrong with police uh, one of the family members of one of the men was was killed shot and killed well, i got to see quite a bit of violence here on american soil and again it's alarming how quickly a city can change from normal every day to chaos so there's a few things that god has gotten me through and with that experience i'd like to share with you some lessons learned, some things that we can learn about rioting, civil unrest, chaos, call it what you want. Lesson number one, don't be in the cities. Okay, so part one, we talked about how to avoid the situation altogether. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. How to get out of the cities be out to begin with, how to get out first, how to avoid the situation. But let's say for whatever reason, you didn't. You were in the city. Imagine you find yourself gridlock freeways, stuck in an environment where the thin veil of polite society is being pulled away quickly. You didn't heed the warning signs and you went to work that day thinking it wouldn't be a big deal. But now, it's starting to become a big deal. Where normally, you know, soccer moms walk down the sidewalk with their $7 Starbucks coffees. And the businessman with a gray suit and tie hurries busily to get to his next meeting on time. Now... Now there's a crowd of people with sticks and stones, literally, with masks on, shaking cars, breaking in windows, tipping over police cruisers, robbing and looting and beating people and taking advantage of them. Seeing somebody with something that they don't like or that they want and by sheer numbers and brute force forcing what they want and taking what they want. Imagine that's a situation that you have to go through. So let's talk a little bit about being the gray man. There's a lot, and especially in the last couple of years, you know, put out about the gray man theory. And it's just that, it's a theory. And there's a time to be a hard target. There's a time to bust out your plate carrier and your AR-15. But this probably isn't that right time. If you have to get through a mob or a crowd of people or out of a city where the entire city has descended into Lord of the Flies. 
This time, you want to be inconspicuous. So let's talk a little bit about Gray Man, how to blend in. In a situation like this, you don't want to appear like you have things that others want, number one. So if you are the kind of guy that wears a suit and tie to work, you might want to have a change of clothes at your office. You might want to keep that stashed in your car, in your office, or whatever. You don't want to appear to be on the other side of the haves and the have-nots. So you want to have a change of clothes. You want to be able to switch that out. If you're wearing a nice collared shirt, you might want to just take that off and wear your t-shirt uncovered. I really hope that you have the forethought to have a nice, comfortable pair of shoes and not nice dress shoes. Again, that can give you away. Shoes are one of the number one indicators, especially me when I was a police officer. I mentioned that I did some more specialized assignments. Well, one of those was fugitive recovery, you know, catching felons, catching people with warrants. And I learned a little bit in that time. And I'll get into a little bit today about reading people. But one of the biggest indicators of somebody's background status is their shoes. So if you do wear that nice suit and tie or whatever, you know, have a good pair of backup, just beat up old sneakers in your car, in your office, in wherever. Number one, there's a good chance you're going to have to run. And you don't want to be running in dress shoes or work boots or whatever it is you wear day to day if you don't have to. So having that change of clothes and a nice pair of running shoes may do a lot more for you than that AR-15 in this situation. And I love, you know, tactical stuff. I do a whole nother show called Gunfighter Life. I still hope that you're every day carrying and you carry a firearm on you and a sidearm on you concealed. You know, I'm a big fan of concealed carry. Concealed carry has quite a bit more tactical advantage. So... In this situation, you still have your concealed carry handgun. And you can probably get away with some kind of messenger bag or some kind of plain Jane looking backpack, you know. But not your tactical molly pack with your plate carrier on it and your gas mask hanging off. That's that's just going to make you a target. But we'll get into gray man packs in a bit. But you have what you have. You have a change of clothes. And here's a big one. Think about the normal way you would get out of the city. Think about the second most normal way you would get out of the city. And get rid of those right off the bat. Don't go those ways. Don't go the way you would normally go out of the city. Because that's probably the way that 90% of the people are going to go. And then the secondary backup way, you know, the side road, the service road. Don't go that way either. Because as soon as that way is cluttered, that's how everybody else is going to try and go. And those are probably going to not be viable for you. What you got is your Lamborghinis and creativity to get out of this situation. Places you wouldn't normally go because they are typically more dangerous might in this situation be far less dangerous. Back alleys, railroad tracks. Most railroad tracks have service roads. Things like that. Things that most people aren't going to think of. If you're in a place like LA, which I lived in quite a bit, you know, there are <coughs> there are aqueducts and places they have for water to go and flash floods. And hopefully it's not flash flooding at this time. It probably wouldn't be or people wouldn't be rioting. But you can use those as ways to get out. Ways to get out of the city. Again, the best way to avoid the violence of a mob is to not be in the mob. So get out of there. Get out of the mob. And if you have to go through a mob, again, gray man, you know, your baseball cap on if you have one, your hood up, and just kind of go through the crowd and don't bring attention to yourself if you can at all help it. Take that fancy watch off and put it in your pocket or whatever. Don't be on your cell phone. Try to blend into the crowd without doing what the crowd is doing if they're doing nefarious things. If everybody's walking at a gingerly pace, you know, rioting, walk in place to place, looting or whatever. Don't be the guy running if nobody else is running. If you don't have to, that's going to make you a target. Blend in. Now, if somebody, if you get picked out as a target, now that's the time to run. So get out of there. Being in shape is important. Cardio is important. We talked about those 
egress routes. You know, there's a good chance you're going to have to climb a fence. You know, plenty of times as a cop, I had to jump a fence. And if you're trying to get out, get through a suburb, get through a city, there's a very good chance you're going to have to scale a fence, a chain link fence. And, you know, take this as a warning. If you can't do that now, start doing that. Not every problem is solved with a gun. You may have to climb a six foot chain link fence. We talked in episode one about rendezvous points. Hopefully you have a rendezvous point somewhere just outside the city. And hopefully your loved one already knows that rendezvous point and knows to meet you there, knows to get you help or something like that. Because as we covered in part one, if something big like this happens, in general, communications go down. You're not just going to be able to get on your cell phone and call. Maybe you have a walkie-talkie in your car as is SOP for my wife and I. You have a certain color of spray paint or something like that, some way to communicate. If all you have is your cell phone, again, try and send several of the same text message over and over. One of them may get through with jam cell towers, but a call almost certainly will not. Now, this is the Alpha Male Podcast. Let's talk about stepping up and being being an alpha male. You know, I wouldn't give this advice to women or children or your teenager or whatever, But if you're an alpha male, if you're a man, I believe it's your responsibility to take care of those around you, those weaker around you. And that might cost you. That might cost you very dearly. But I think as an alpha male, you ought to be willing to do that. And if not, then maybe you should go listen to the Beta Male podcast. Talk about the importance of being armed, having a weapon, carrying a knife, carrying a gun... You know we're big on that here, the EDC. And in this situation, and a lot of other situations, it's far more likely you're going to have to use those things or just your bare hands to help others more than yourself. If you see you know, a woman, an elderly person getting beaten to death, are you just going to stand there while that happens? you got to answer that question for yourself. But I'll answer it with the Word of God. As it is written, do not stand idly by while your neighbor's blood is shed. So I know what I'm going to do. But you need to be circumspect and have some self-examination. Are you willing to step up and put yourself in danger to save somebody else? And you heard my background. I've kind of made a living in life. you know, Serving in the military, protecting the country, serving as a police officer the commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters, I've kind of made it my business to put myself in harm's way to protect the lives of others. And I don't regret that. And I don't apologize for that. And I don't think that I could as a man stand idly by while somebody raped a woman in the street in a riot or like what happened in Occupy Wall Street and all those things. I don't think I could stand by while somebody beat some, you know, somebody to death to take their stuff. Or because they were on the other political side or the other political party. You know, I don't think I could stand by and watch that happen. And I hope you couldn't either. And I believe that's something you ought to think about now. You ask any top competitive shooter, which is something I have experience with, or any top athlete, they envision what they're going to do before they do it. They run through the scenario in their mind. They see themselves winning. They see themselves what they're going to do before it's done. The battle is already won in the mind before it's won in the hands or in the feet. So you ought to be thinking about these things now. Thinking about them. Scenarios that might happen and how you might react. What you would do. So that hopefully the day never comes. But if it does come that you're ready. That you're watching and being ready. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this somewhat heavy topic on Alpha Male Podcast. Again, hopefully by God's grace this becomes a series. I'd like to get into the gear that you should carry. We've done EDC episodes, but maybe a bag for this. We'll get into that in the future. We'll perhaps discuss bugging in, staying in if you're stuck in a cubicle in an office, if something like that happens with an active shooter. I'd like to discuss a bailout bag that you can grab and go and would be small enough and inconspicuous enough to just carry and wouldn't draw a lot of attention. So again, make sure you're subscribed. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review. 
If you want to check out more, go to goodshepherdtraining.com. Again, that's goodshepherdtraining.com. If you thought this episode or any of the previous episodes were entertaining and educational enough to be supported, please consider supporting on Patreon. The link again is on goodshepherdtraining.com. These are free for you to listen to, and I like it that way, but they're not free to put out and produce. So I'd encourage you to consider supporting what I would consider this manly ministry. And as a thanks for staying tuned till the end, let's get into the tactical tip of the day. We've talked a lot today in this episode about physical security, but let's switch gears on the tactical tip and talk about some cyber security. If you live in the modern world, in the modern era, and you have a smartphone, you are probably exhausted by trying to remember passwords. This password is this, and this password is that, and my Amazon password is this, and my bank password is that. And it's, let's be honest, it's frustrating. Well, let's say, and this I'm making this up, this is by no means my password. Let's say my basic password is Rhodesian Ridgeback, as I have in Rhodesian Ridgeback named Alexander Hamilton, who is napping in front of me while I do this podcast. Let's say that my general password is Rhodesian Ridgeback, capital R on Rhodesian and capital R on Ridgeback. Let's say I'm on my Midway USA account, which if you don't know is a big shooting company, firearms company, and I'm buying stuff from there, which I probably do more often than I should. And I'm on Midway USA. My password for Midway USA would be Rhodesian Ridgeback, and then I would take the initials of the words M and W, Midway, so it would be Rhodesian Ridgeback MW. If I need the little symbols, then I would do those initials again while holding the shift key and making the symbols, whatever they are. I don't have a an example of that, but you get the point. And if I'm going to do my bank, let I don't have this bank, but let's say my bank is Bank of America. So I would do Rhodesian Ridgeback BOA. And that way I don't have to remember a bunch of passwords and every password is unique because they say don't use the same password over and over and over again. Is that the best? Is that like going to stop the, the, you know, the Pentagon from getting into your stuff? No, but it, it's not bad. Another one we talked about bugging out and getting out and hopefully you have a bug out bag. An important thing to have is your important documents. We spend all this money on gear and guns and and survival food and all this stuff. But do you have photocopies of your passport, your driver's license, all that stuff so you can prove who you are, your birth certificate. Have that in your little messenger bag or whatever. Or maybe on a USB. But either way, here's a good way to have your bank account and routing numbers so that nobody can get them. And they'll be in plain sight. Pick a number, any number, talk it over with your spouse or whomever has your bank account information and say, okay, this is my bank account number, the actual one. We're just going to add seven to every number. This is a really easy encryption, a really easy thing to do. Again, is it going to stop the CIA from cracking your bank account? No, but they probably have it anyway if they want it. They probably just get a hold of the bank and they'll give it to them. But for the average person that finds that piece of paper, They're not going to know that. They're not going to know what number to add and subtract or whatever from your bank account number or your routing number or any other important number. But you'll know and your spouse will know, and that's good enough. You subtract 7 from every number or add 7 to every number. Obviously, if that bumps it up above 10, then you go to 0 and start over. Again, it's not the best encryption, but it will stop most people, especially if they just find pieces of paper with stuff written on there. They're not going to know what it is. So that's your tactical tips of the day. And again, if you thought that was worth a dollar, consider supporting on Patreon. Now we get into the good stuff, the tactical verse of the day. Men, this verse is coming at you from 1 Corinthians. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I'll reiterate a small portion of that again. For you were bought at a price. 
I'll say it again. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Remember that. I don't know when you're going to listen to this, but I plan on this coming out on Friday. And I did not grow up a Christian. I certainly was, let's say, walking in the world when I was younger. And I know what a lot of young men do on the weekends. But I hope you remember this verse. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. So remember that with whatever you're doing with your body. Whatever other most other young men are doing and polluting themselves with, you are not called to be like other men. You are an alpha male. You're called to be set apart. That's what the word holy means. So be set apart. Be different. And I'm very blessed that I, I know that young men listen to this. Kids listen to this. So I'm not going to get vulgar. But you know what I'm talking about, young men. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Remember that going into the weekend. Be strong enough to stand up and be different and be holy and be better. Be an alpha male and have a blessed day.